Hello, peoples, and welcome to Esoterica Cinema, the podcast where we take films from the cinematic multiverse and discuss the hell out of them. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> My name is Jason Peters, and I'm coming at you not with another patented five minute review. No, sorry, no. Today, we are going to discuss what makes cinema cinema. That's right, directorially, screenplay wise. All those other things that make movies movies on a little feature that I'm calling pending a discussion with my co-host Ryan, who is certain to tell me what a horrible, horrible idea this all is. Esoterica Intelligentsia! Okay, guys, so good news. I'm not going to do the entire episode in that voice. Just a little bit of fun we're having at the top of the episode. At least I certainly had fun. I know it was probably at your expense. But regardless, yeah, we are going to do something new today. So we are in the off season officially post season three P season four. That's a way of saying pre season four. I like to put a little, you know, something extra on it there. And so I figured, you know, let's go ahead and like start to figure out what are some other features that we can introduce on this show? What are some other aspects of film that we could really discuss specifically that we haven't done so far? And one thought that occurred to me is that we have many times over the course of what damn near 60 different discussions now, plus bonus episodes for films. We've talked about the hero's journey and how it relates to screenplays and screenplay structure We've discussed three-act structure, but we've never really gone into the specifics of each of the beats that really comprise a traditional three-act structure or Campbellian hero's journey, which does apply to novels as well. It's actually – the Campbell hero's journey is actually a novel construct first and foremost, by which I don't mean a new construct. It's been around since the early 50s or so, and it also applies to screenplays because screenplays have very much – borrowed from the more popular novels. Uh, and look, this dates all the way back, you know, at Campbell's theory, it's really just an extension of Aristotle's own theory on three-act structure, dating back to, I wish I knew history and could tell you when Aristotle lived. But look, we all know it was a long time ago, right? So yeah, back then. So yeah, like I said, for right now, we're going to go ahead and call this uh, Esoterica Intelligentsia because, hey, why not make this even more obtuse and difficult for people to find us? I'm sure that my co-host Ryan is going to have plenty to say about that. I have not approached him about this yet, and uh, I'm sure he is currently listening and aghast at this. But I'm just going to go ahead and let me get it out as many times as I can before he tells me no. Esoterica intelligentsia, esoterica intelligentsia, esoterica intelligentsia, esoterica intelligentsia. Wow, I impressed myself. I could have gone like seven more times on that. Okay, so who is this Campbell guy and what is the hero's journey? Quite simply, it's an extension of the idea of monomyth. Okay, which was actually first sort of uh, ideated by James Joyce uh, back in the 1800s. And it was later identified in 1949 in Joseph Campbell's book Hero of a Thousand Faces, in which he attempts to break down the monomyth, which uh, if you don't know what that is, he basically says that every story that exists is a version of this monomyth, is a version of this hero's journey. We would actually ascribe hero's journey to it later in life. Joseph Campbell called it monomyth in his book. And it's actually a very simple construct. By now, you know, here in 2023, we've seen this so many times. I mean, so many of the films that we watch, like probably over 90%, right, if you got down to it, would follow this structure. And certainly all of the popular films, certainly most of the popular films do anyway, And a very simple sentence that really breaks down the crux of what his theory is, is this quote from the book. A hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Fabulous forces are there encountered and a decisive victory is won. The hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow men. So, yeah, again, this was written in 1949. They probably wouldn't use the word boons today, right? It'd be riches or something like that, right? But we all understand what is being said here. And, again, if we actually look at how this is just an evolution of Aristotle's own three-act structure, there's something like, I want to say, 19 beats, 19 specific beats or so that Campbell has identified that comprise the hero's journey. And... They're a little esoteric, <laughs> no pun intended. And so instead of using that to sort of 
take you on this journey, this hero's journey <laughs> of what the hero's journey is, I'm actually going to go ahead and break down Aristotle's three-act structure just because it uses a little bit, believe it or not, despite being even older, it uses a little bit more simplified language or at least the way that we have interpreted over the years. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to go through these one by one so that you, the listener, can really get a sense of what each of these are. I'm going to go through them pretty quickly so that, you know, this doesn't turn into 45 minutes of just me going like, bro, and then this is an inciting incident and blah, blah, blah. And let's look back, right? That would get boring super quick. So we're going to go through it pretty quickly here. I'm going to identify each of them. And we're going to use a popular film that all of us should be very familiar with. If you're not, shame on you because it's one of the greats. It's made billions of dollars, spawned multiple sequels, and that's the very first Jurassic Park directed by Steven Spielberg uh, based off of a screenplay from Michael Crichton based off his own book and, of course, starring the incomparable Sam Neill and Laura Dern. Now, admittedly, this structure is mostly utilized by popular films and films that would follow a popular execution. When you get into, like, you know, narrative films and, and art films and metaphorical films, obviously, this is not really going to apply as much. Though you would be surprised to see how much of this will still apply just because it's so inherent to the story structure that we've come to know over the years. So, like I said, let's go ahead and dive in here. What we're going to do is we're going to look at Aristotle's three-act structure and each of the beats that make up each of those three acts as it pertains to Jurassic Park. So our very first aspect of three-act structure is very simply beginning. It's the beginning of the story. We're going to get introduced to the world and hopefully the protagonist, the supporting character, as well as hopefully our antagonist. And in Jurassic Park, we actually do all three of those very quickly. In this film, it could be argued that the antagonist is actually the dinosaurs themselves, right? Maybe the lawyer, but not really. That's more of a joke. The dinosaurs really are the antagonist. And if you wanted to say who is the supreme antagonist, that would be the velociraptors as a whole, taken as an individual unit. And the very opening scene introduces us to that antagonist and shows us the velociraptors killing the people in the shooter, that whole scene, right? Shoot! From there, we're introduced to Alan and Ellie, who are going to be our protagonist and our main supporting character. And that's our beginning, right? We see that they're archaeologists on an excavation site. That's all you need. That's your beginning. Story is set up. World is set up. The next beat is what's known as our inciting incident, and this is not going to be where the story starts in earnest. This is going to be the first action of the story that sets up the story being started in earnest. So in this case, in Jurassic Park, it's John Hammond arriving at the excavation site. You know, uh, what is it? Alan and Ellie, they walk in the trailer and he's got their champagne and he pops it and he's like, we were saving that. Alan is. And John's like, oh, yeah, for this moment. Right. That's the inciting incident of the story. It's going to lead to John's revelation, which leads to his invitation and ultimately to them accepting it and starting off our story in earnest when they do go to Jurassic Park and the great helicopter scene, right? So that inciting incident is just very simply John Hammond arriving at the excavation site and telling them of the park and making that invitation. Now, from there, we have what's known as second thoughts. Really don't have to imagine that hard to see what this might be, right? It's our main character resisting going on this call to adventure, right? And we see that with Alan where he's like, eh, I don't know about this, Ellie, you know, uh, get the wrong. And she kind of joshes him a little bit and ultimately tells him like, hey, you know, you, we have to do this. And he's like, yeah, okay, you know, you're right. And so they go ahead and they do ultimately accept the journey, right? And that would bring us to our next beat, which is the first act climax or what we'll also call Plot point one. And again, this is like what kicks the story off in earnest, right? In Lord of the Rings, this is like where they leave and they're they're going to search for, uh, you know, Sauron or whatever it is, right? And in this film, it's where they literally get on the helicopter and they depart and they go into the jungle towards the actual Jurassic Park. And we get the great theme music and we get the great helicopter shots and again, this is where our story really kicks off in earnest. This is the end of Act 1. From here, we're obviously moving forward into Act 2, and that carries with it uh, certain other principles that we'll look at right now. Now, in writing and screenwriting structure, it's kind of funny because your first acts and your third acts tend to write themselves. And then everyone says, like, well, just sort of, you know, fill in space for the second act until you get there. But the funny thing is that traditionally speaking, you're going to want your first act to take 25 percent of your screenplay in terms of overall length. And you're going to want your third act to do the same. So really, the second act is the combined length of your first and third act at 50 percent. 
So, you know, you, if you meander too much and you don't have a focus, you're going to lose your audience entirely. So because of that, there is an inherent structure that's been identified to keep audiences engaged in this hero's journey. And really what it is, is setting them up with obstacles, right? It's all about challenge. If our hero doesn't have to overcome anything, there's no stakes, there's no challenge, we're not interested. So really, as a screenwriter, we're going to throw as many, or as an author, we're going to throw as many challenges at our protagonist as possible over the course of this second act. And this is, again, more popular structure though again you can you can just as easily apply this to dramatic structure where the obstacles have more to do with relationships and very human emotions conflicting with one another right in this sense we're looking at Jurassic Park which is an adventure film and so it's going to be literal physical obstacles right in an adventure sort of mode but obstacles can look any number of ways so very simply after we get our plot point one our next beat is going to be obstacle one and we don't want to go too strong, right? We want to give ourselves room to escalate over the course of the story. So it's going to be a pretty low stakes obstacle. And in Jurassic Park, indeed it is where very simply the tour doesn't go as planned, right? The obstacle is that John Hammond wants all of these dinosaurs and creatures to come out on this Jeep tour ride and none of them do. And it's disappointing and you know, there's an obstacle where he's trying to get them to come out, but they won't come out, and he's trying to lure them with food and all of this, right? And it's just not happening. And then, of course, that's when the kids and the adults get bored, and they end up leaving, and we see the sick triteratops, and then that's a great device to separate Ellie from the rest of the pack, which is what happens, right? But again, a really low-stakes first obstacle so that we have room to grow. The second one, a little bit higher, our next beat is obstacle two. Again, Jurassic Park, very simply, we have a tropical storm approaching, right? And and that's just very simply the next obstacle. First, okay, the ride's not working, no big deal. Okay, next one, now a storm's coming in, uh, starting to rise, right? Already we're starting to see that rising tension come about. And this is going to set up later obstacles that are going to evolve off of one another. So you want, ideally, your obstacles to feed into one another so that they're constantly escalating and building like a like a set of stairs, right? Just constantly stepping up one to the other. And from there, and nope, you thought it was going to be obstacle three, right? Nope, not that easy. No, the next beat that we're going to have is what we're going to call our midpoint twist. Now, this can be something very dramatic that changes the nature of the story on its head, something like Fight Club, which doesn't really come in the middle of the film. It's probably about two-thirds of the way through the film. But you will notice as you start to identify this structure that there's a lot of leeway. Screenwriters take a lot of leeway with regards to where a lot of these things come into play. And some films have very long first acts that will actually take up like 50% of the script. The Matrix, for example, has an, has famously has like most of the film is actually a first act. If you actually look at it from a story perspective and then the third act climax in the Matrix is where Neo realizes his powers, which is like two minutes before credits roll. So there's a lot of leeway. This is just sort of like the template from which people can derive their own artistic expression from but again it's not that you have to follow this structure but this structure works and if you do follow it you will have a film on your hand with a beginning middle and end and sometimes that might sound trite but oftentimes writing an effective story really is just as simple as making sure you have an effective beginning middle and end so what's the midpoint twist in Jurassic Park, you ask? It is when our friend Dennis Nedry, that's right, the scheming Dennis Nedry, who at the beginning was bribed by a corporate rival named Dodson. Dodson! Dodson! We've got Dodson here! Yep, yep, we've got Dodson here. To cut power uh, to the park, well, he was bribed by him to steal the dinosaur embryos. And then at this point in the film, what Nedry does in order to uh, achieve that is he cuts all of the power to the park. And so now, on top of everything else that's been going on, zero power in the park. This switches things up dramatically, right? Because this is going to set up our next obstacle we'll get to in just a moment. And again, in terms of staying within the confines of the story and the world and the structure we've created, but also flipping it on its head enough to really raise the stakes and make it interesting for the audience, this is a really effective way that they do that. So he cuts to the power to the park. Obviously, he books it in a Jeep with the embryos. You know, he gets the the spit dinosaur kills him later. And but yeah, in terms of that midpoint twist, again, cutting the power, changing and raising those stakes immediately. 
All of this leads to our next beat, which is, yes, obstacle three. That's right. Our third obstacle, uh, paying attention to our rule of threes. Again, you can have seven obstacles. You can have 13. What you do in between these beats is completely up to you, and that's where the creativity comes into play. Some people think that, oh, if I follow this template, there's no room for creativity. Look, there's like, you know, 17 specific concepts that you have to hit and at no point is anyone dictating to you what any of these have to be so you know i would argue that there's still plenty of room plus all of the space in between these is yours as an artist to fill in so let's not forget that so what is the third obstacle in jurassic park well with the electrified fences no longer active t-rex and the other dinosaurs break loose and of course we get the all-time great scene of the Kids and Alan and Ian and all of them being attacked by T-Rex in the Jeep, which still just holds up so perfectly. It's a beautiful, horrific scene. The next beat is actually our Act 2 climax, which would be considered our plot point two. So there's still a lot of space to fill in between Obstacle 3 and this second plot point. And this is where you're going to have sort of your final confrontation, or the story itself is going to kind of come to a climax. And... In Jurassic Park, this would be where Hammond and our chief engineer, Ray Arnold. Hold on to your butts. Yep, the great Sam Jackson. Have to reboot the park system, which they do. And and as well, Alan and the kids who are separated have to shut down the grid. And what does this do? This sets up the next beat which is going to be our disaster and crisis, right? Some Some... Resources will separate disaster and crisis as two separate things. Really, disaster is the action that sets up the crisis, right? So if the disaster in this case is that the grid is shut down, it leads to the crisis, which is that the velociraptors are released, right? And and that's where we are in this film, where that's the ultimate obstacle right the the last biggest baddest obstacle of all the final boss if you will right that's where this comes into play with this this disaster and crisis and again in this movie it's the velociraptors we were introduced to them at the beginning of the film as the primary antagonist therefore they need to have that final confrontation which is here and now at our disaster and crisis beat now the next beat that sets up is our act 3 climax which is really ultimately the resolution of that disaster and crisis. So in Jurassic Park it's with the power restored. Alan and the kids try to escape through the main entrance but they're cornered by velociraptors, right? And we get the swelling moment. It's it's do or die time, right? They're finally going to get theirs. They've spent the whole movie evading death, but death is inevitable at this point. But then at the last minute, the Tyrannosaurus comes in and it saves the day and we get the heroic music. And that's going to be our actual climax, right? That is the climax of the Jurassic Park story. Everything culminates in the Velociraptors almost killing them when, when T-Rex, the mightiest of them all, dinosaurs being stronger than man, nature being stronger than man, this theme reinforced over the course of the film does come in and save the day that is our third act climax okay that's the final biggest action of the film from there we're into our third act and we're simply winding down so our third acts tend to be very short in in dramatic films they will be much more drawn out what you'll see is that in action films certain sci-fi films the third act can often be very truncated And it's just because, you know, we're here for action and usually after that climax, there's no more room for action. So in an action film, the third act, you know, we're going to want to get out of there pretty quick. So we're not going to see a lot of characters, what they learned, how their lives were affected down the road. That's really more of a dramatic device. But either way, the next beat is going to be descending action, right? Bringing things back down for the audience. So in this case, Hammond arrives in his Jeep with Malcolm and he picks up Ian and the kids. We know that they're safe. Everyone's being brought back together. Our tension is coming back down. And then from there, we go into our final beat, which is the wrap up and resolution. In this case, just very simply, the entire group of people that were on the island having to escape with their lives. They finally do. They board the helicopter and they leave the island. That's the resolution. They they won. They escaped with their lives. They leave. And then we get our ending, the final beat that wraps up the entire three-act structure and hero's journey. So 
Again, this was just sort of a little peek behind the curtain of some of the story structure elements for people that either have never been exposed to these concepts or maybe it's been a while and you wanted a refresher or, you know, maybe it's just good to have a gut check and listen to what someone else has to say on the matter. Hopefully you learned a little bit here or a lot here and you can start to carry these with you and look for these in films because, again, there is a lot of leeway with regards to when and where these specific beats show up but whether the artist and the writer intends to or not these are just inherent in most popular cinema so look out for some of these concepts thanks for joining us here on possibly the last esoterica intelligentsia pending ryan's approval either way do have yourself a wonderful rest of the day and enjoy the movies